I'm Wonderful. recording to the cloud and let's give it a start. Last webinar of the day today under the big thematic day, let's share and connect. This is Ali Azuddin from Food Generation for Education. I'm so excited to collaborate in this last session with Julie. Uh, Julie is attending from the US and usually it happens like that. I have the people in Asia in the morning and finishing the day with the people based in the US. Uh, people are watching us from Philippines, Brazil, Lebanon, UAE, Canada, uh, India, Portugal, Oman, the whole planet is here, Julie. So <laughs> I'm going to give you now the stage, the virtual one, and let's give it a start. Concept-driven learning that transfers. And let me check if Mihai is with us. Hello, Mihai, if he is in the attendees. Yes, I'm seeing some, recognizing some names. Welcome, everybody. It's so great to be here. Ali and I met uh, many years ago at the Lynn Erickson uh, Concept-Based Certification Institute, and I was her social studies specialist for six of the certification institutes, so it was hundreds of people that we trained, but you stood out. Anybody who knows Ali, you know he's memorable, your passion, you're so positive and joyful. Look at that smile's always there. Um, and so thank it you, was Julie. just such a so wonderful to uh, be asked to be here. So thank you very much for hosting me. Um, I have up here my two books that were part of Lynn Erickson's concept based series called Tools for Teaching Conceptual Understanding. These were my first two books. There's a secondary edition and an elementary edition. And then more recently, this past year, I published Visible Learning for Social Studies with John Hattie, Doug Fisher, and Nancy Fry. Um, and coming up soon, super exciting, which is why we're calling this Concept Driven Learning That Transfers, is we have a book coming out. I think some of my co-authors might be on in chat. Um, called Learning That Transfers. And it's sort of a synthesis of everything that we have read, researched, looked at. And so I'm really excited to be with all of you today. So if you're on if social media, if you're using social media, please use the hashtag, brand new hashtag, LTT for learning that transfers. So I'll be giving you guys some uh, sort of sneak peek into that new book in this session. So here's a question. I'd love to have your participation in chat. What do you want your students to do with your discipline, whether you're a PE teacher, whether you're a science teacher, or if you're an elementary teacher, maybe you teach multiple subjects, what are some possible scenarios students might face? So I'm gonna play a little music. And if you could just put into chat, what do you want your students to do with whatever it is that they're learning in the future? So go ahead and let us know, what do you want your students to do? Put it into chat. Uh, generalize the learning to other situation at home mm -hmm. and at school. This mm -hmm. is the first one. Learning should be fun. Be good problem solvers. Make connections. Uh, take action. Yes be able to be principled and th that chat is going very fast and <laughs> I need to remind everyone to put all panelists and attendees mm -hmm. so you can see this uh, uh, start we are on fire learning <laughs> uh, to take action to transfer the skill uh, to see the world around them and understand it uh, again the word transfer is coming title of our session. I'm also checking my Facebook to make sure that I'm reading and checking the people who are uh, watching us on Facebook uh, to think critically with what they are learning and the learning should be applied in real life. Wow, you guys, awesome. Apply their learning, critical thinking, all of these things we're seeing. Yes, make sure you click on the blue thing that says to panelists and attendees, because a lot of you are sending it just to, to me and Ali, I think. Um, but really awesome. What you all are talking about, and some of you use the word transfer, but to apply learning to new situations, that's what we're so passionate about. We want to make sure that students can use their learning in the future. That's what transfer is. Um, and so beyond sort of memorizing, none of you said memorize facts, um, <laughs> even though we feel like sometimes that's where our job as teachers. And so really all of the things that you all said is sort of can be encapsulated in the idea of transfer. So here's our learning intentions for our hour together. I hope that by the end of this session, you can consider how education needs to evolve. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this is because of our changing world. So we'll talk a little bit about that. 
The next one is describe the role of concepts in transfer of learning. So I know many of you on today are familiar with conceptual understanding. Um, and so what's the role of concepts in transfer of learning? And then build a culture of transfer that empowers students to unlock new situations. So that's our hope. How can, by the end of this session, we do all three of these things? We're going to go pretty quickly to make sure that we do that. So considering the first one, how I wanted to say, I wanted to say yes. let's check your time management because it also came in that chat. We need them to know how to deal with time. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I saw that. Yes, let's check my time management for sure. So <laughs> how does our changing world impact teaching and learning? That's kind of what I, the first few slides I set up around this question. How does our changing world impact teaching and learning? And so this is one of my passions. I look outside of education. I look to, and I have some, some um, different thoughts leaders I'm going to share with you all today and what they're saying. So one of them that I love is named Tom Friedman. Thomas Friedman, he uh, is the New York Times foreign policy correspondent. He writes a lot of books and he says basically the 1900s, the 20th century, jobs, most jobs were, were jobs where students are or employees, I should say, needed to remember what it was that they were taught, routine professionals, manufacturers, and there were very few jobs for transfer, like inventors, things like that. Well, we know that the balance has shifted. How many of you, I always ask this question in my training, put in chat, me, if you know someone who started their own business. Ali is an example. So if you know Ali, then you're what? If you know someone who maybe is a professional like farmer, baker, lawyer, doctor, but they went to their boss and said, I can do this in a creative, new, different way. How many of you know someone like that? And of course, there's inventors, people who make apps, people who make new, new technology. And so the balance is shifting where we have to help our young people transfer their learning, apply it in new and creative ways ways. And so what does that mean for teachers? Ah, Nelly, Nelly is a really good friend. And she said she started her own business. I would like to know what is this? <laughs> and then yes. uh, a cousin of mine started his own business. Uh, most of my family are entrepreneurs. So these are some of the comments in that chat. And yes, awesome. you're right, Julie, that we are going to see more inventors in the, in the near future. Yeah, and so one of the people that I love to look to, another person is Simon Sinek, and he said this, he said, innovators often come from outside of the industry. So his examples are Netflix. It wasn't Hollywood, it wasn't Blockbuster, it was outside of the industry that they came in and now dominates television and movies, outside of the industry. Another example is the e-reader, Kindle, Nook, all of those things. It wasn't inside the publishing company that just completely revolutionized uh, reading. It was a diff outside of the industry. Also, iTunes. It wasn't um, sort of music labels and things like that. It was a computer company that created iTunes. So he says this, which gives me pause. The profession will, will basically survive, will do fine if you're the ones willing to blow up your own business. If you protect your business, it will be blown up for you by someone outside the industry. And this got me thinking, how does this apply to schools? We sometimes take for granted that schools are what they are and they'll always be what they are. But we maybe need to think about that and pause and ask ourselves, okay, if what he's saying is true, my question for you all is what are we protecting? What are we protecting in our industry? Or another way to put it, and I would love for you all to put in chat, what in schooling needs to be disrupted? So I play some music and we'll just let the chat go. Make sure you put panelists and attendees. What in education needs to be disrupted? Go ahead and, and share with us in chat. While we are waiting for these uh, chats to, to start coming up, I would like to, to say schedules like those timetables mm. that we they've been mm -hmm. existing for ages and ages and we still mm. want them but really last week i was sharing with other educators that uh, let's say when we go back to normal and there is no more virtual mm. learning and schools are back students are back i said we should embed in our weekly 
uh, timetables a day for synchronous and asynchronous learning where students can stay at home and learn from home. And then the people, they were looking at me, I know the parents will not accept. <laughs> and so let's check what do we have here in the, in the chat, uh, old method, assessment, testing, report cards, um, the set of way that we are doing things that it's only one way only one answer uh, grading timetables again standardized assessment uh, misunderstanding collaboration and what does mm. collaboration mean uh, voila these are some ideas in the chat and again standardized test is coming back let us remind you it seems we will have a lot of idea make sure you are putting all panelists and attendee trisha i love this one the annual calendar also the mm -hmm. academic year starts in september and finishes in july or in april and finishing in december if you are in india so Love it. Wow, yeah. you guys. Excellent, excellent. I love uh, all I the things you're saying. I think you can take saying. many of these idea from the chat uh, for maybe a blog or... Uh... Yes, 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 yes. Excellent. Thank you all so much for sharing. And I think assessments was probably the number one or something uh -huh. about assessment, standardized testing, grading, marking um, is usually the number one. Uh, and, and many of you said also the curriculum or, or just the idea of this set curriculum. And so one of the things that is within our control, because a lot of those things you all are talking about are somewhat outside of a teacher's control, but what's inside a teacher's control is shifting in the way we view our our coursework, our standards, our learning outcomes from subjects to disciplines. So if I think I teach a subject, I think of content coverage, I think of rote memorization, I think of the students as receivers of the knowledge that I have. If I think of my discipline as a discipline, it implies cognitive apprenticeship where I want to get their thinking out into the world and I want to help them refine how they think about my subject or my discipline. It implies training and self-control. And it also implies students being constructors of knowledge. So a lot of you said you want your students to apply their learning to the real world. And so that's one shift that we can make. Um, and so we just were about to launch a course called uh, Future of Learning, where we explore that question. So that's kind of why I wanted to put that out there. What needs disrupting? We have a whole week on assessments, um, a whole week on curriculum instruction, a whole week on the role of the student and the teacher, um, because there are things we can do to shift our our thinking and, and our practices. So I want to share this little video of my son. Um, this was him when he came back from pre-K. Many of you who know me, you probably know this video, but he came back and he was so excited about his science experiment. He said, mommy, today we did an investigation. And so I said, okay, tell me about your investigation. Um, and so I want to put up the volume a little bit here to make sure you guys can hear him. So he's going to tell us what's inside his little baggie here for his investigation. Okay, you guys got it. Water, red food coloring, and flour. Supposed to make slime. You can tell it probably didn't really work if you look at that little baggie. Um, but of course, because I'm me, my next question is, what did you learn from your experiment? So here is, here's his sharing of what did he learn? Oops. oops. Sorry, what did you learn from your experiment? Water. Make this go away. Here we go. What did you learn from your experiment? Hmm, I didn't know. I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't know what he learned. Um, and you can see his little face. He's kind of like, that's probably not good. Um, and so here's what I want to share about this is I used to think that hands on learning will prepare my students for the future. And I used to think so hard about how am I going to engage them? How am I going to get hands on learning? How am I going to get? And I still believe in hands on learning. But this is sort of my refined thinking. It's conceptual organization and building a culture of transfer to authentic settings is going to prepare my students for the future. So I wanna share with you a little, wanna unpack my current thinking that not just hands-on learning by itself, but conceptual organization and a culture of transfer is going to prepare my students for lifelong learning. So what if we developed conceptual questions? So the words in blue here are what I would call concepts and see how these questions not only frame his little investigation that he did here, but can transfer to any investigation he might do in the future. So what questions can we make about mixing different materials together? 
What is the role of asking questions in our investigations? And how does our investigation impact the materials? That would build conceptual organization in his brain. That would allow him to think deeply about this investigation and transfer his learning to any investigation that happens in the future. So let's unpack a little bit the word concept because my thinking has evolved here as well. Since we met Ali, I'm using something slightly different than when you and I met. So here is something I have for you all. It's called Four Corners and I sim it's, it's in all of my books basically. I give students four sort of roughly correct definitions of a concept and I wanna see where they are. And here's what I wanna try with you all. Don't put your answer in chat yet. Is this something that I learned from Doug Fisher? It's called waterfall chat. For those of you who are in virtual settings, what you can do is you put a timer on the screen. So I have just 15 seconds here. So while it's counting down, think about your answer and when it gets to zero, so you can type your answer, you can type A, B, C, or D, but don't hit enter. When it gets to zero, hit, hit enter. Does that make sense for everybody? So which definition of the word concept best matches your understanding? Put A, B, C, or D in chat, but don't hit enter until the timer goes off. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. Don't hit it yet, don't hit it yet, don't hit it yet. <laughs> wait, 15 seconds. Wait, wait. Uh, good, she just sent it to us, all panelists. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, here we go. <laughs> Coming into chat. Um, isn't that fun? So that's just a cool strategy to sort of get your students to wait if you're in a virtual setting is sort of put a little timer there. Um, so they're all coming in a lot of A's. That's in my, my Tools for Teaching Conception Understanding book, Timeless Universal Abstract. A lot of C's. Um, and so for me, the answer is actually D. So I see Mihai and a few others who know my work, who know my courses are choosing D, an organizing idea. And it's not that A, B, or C are wrong. I just want you all to sort of see what I mean and how my thinking has evolved over time. I used to use a timeless universal and abstract. I don't use that anymore, mostly because of the concept of dinosaur. Dinosaurs are extinct, but dinosaurs are a concept to me. So I'll give you guys one more example about why I think that organizing idea is the most sort of a, a best way to use that word. So here's some research. A cognitive scientist named John Bransford says the reason that experts remember more is that what novices or beginners see as separate pieces of information, experts see as organized sets of ideas. So really want to help our students see the world in this organized way. And so I use concepts to help students to see the world through these organized ideas. And the reason I don't use big idea anymore is because big idea to me, well, actually, let me not go there. Let me go to the next slide and let you guys do this again. This is called a concept attainment. So similarly, I don't have any music, but I wanna just give everybody like 10 seconds to look at these groups of words and think about what's going on with group one What's going on in comparison to group two? And what's going on in comparison to group three? What's happening between those three groups? How are they different from each other? So I'm gonna give you 10 seconds and then I'm gonna say, so you can go ahead and type into chat, but don't hit enter, don't hit return just yet. So type your response, what's happening between these words? Type your response. I'm checking the people on Facebook. They are also listening mm. and not typing directly, so. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna count down and I want you to hit enter. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, enter. Go ahead and hit enter. Oh, love it. So someone said going from macro to micro. Some people are saying group one or general to specific, Sue and I love that. That's really what I'm trying to get at here. So some are saying group one is key concepts for PYP, which is why I did that, yes. Um, and three, someone is saying is facts, very nice. So here's how I would label these. Group one and group two are to me concepts. Group one and group two. Oftentimes for PYP teachers, they're like, what? So group one and group two 
our concepts. I would call group one transdisciplinary concepts and group two disciplinary concepts. They're specific to the discipline, but they're still transferable. They're still organizing ideas. And here's what I would call group three. I'd either call them facts or examples. So sometimes a fact is easy in social studies or if it's English language arts, it's the actual text, like the name of a book, that's a fact. But sometimes things are examples of a larger concept. Concepts are almost like those Russian nesting dolls. I saw we had someone in on from Russia, you know, those nesting dolls, because you can think of like, let's take triangle. Triangle for a very young kid is a concept. And the critical attributes of a triangle is a three-sided figure. Eventually triangle becomes an example of a shape. So that's kind of just my quick sort of uh, explanation. And I'm really interested in this group number two. So sometimes- so, uh, Julie, yeah. Mark is asking if you want to connect to the PYP language, is group two the related concept? Yes, and thank I would you, say Martha. yes. Thank you, Martha, absolutely. Um, so key concepts and related concepts. And one change the IB made that I really appreciate is sort of eliminating the hierarchy, eliminating the idea that that key concepts are more important than related, um, that they're both important. Um, they both play an important role in organizing students' understanding. So here's my definition, our current definition in our next book. A concept is an organizing idea containing uh, distinct attributes that are shared across multiple examples. An organizing idea with distinct attributes that are shared across multiple examples. With my own students, I say they're words we can use to categorize our world. And then what do we do with it is really the important part. So I'm gonna to get to that. I wanna do my time management and make sure I get to what do we do with it? So here's the way I see some of you are using macro, micro uh, related. This is the way that I talk about it in, in our current book that's coming out is there's a level of abstraction. So sub would be what Lynn Erickson would call micro, what the people, what PYP would call related, but really specific, really like dinosaur. That would be a sub concept. Anchor is what we're calling that anchor the unit. So I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that. And then we have disciplinary and transdisciplinary. And so the first step often for teachers, not PYP because you guys are already using lots of concepts, but if you're teaching in a more traditional setting with your sort of content heavy standards of learning, learning outcomes, the first step is often to make sure that your topics are organized around some concepts. And so we have uh, some, some tools for that to help you all think through that on our website and we'll make sure I share that by the end. Here's another cognitive scientist that's influenced my thinking, Jerome Bruner. He says, grasping the structure of a subject is understanding in a way that permits many other things to be related to it meaningfully. So not only if we look at that first cognitive scientist, he says, if it's organized, kids will remember better. And this guy is saying, if it's organized in a structure, students will transfer better. And so what do we know about transfer is that kids are really bad at it and they need to practice it a lot. And so that's why I talk about building a culture of transfer. So here's our three-step process. If you signed up to the webinar, you saw that we said there's a three-step process. We need students to acquire understanding of individual concepts. That's why those are those little circles by themselves. Then they connect those concepts in relationship. That's why you see them sort of connected there. And those connections are what transfer to new situations. And so that is our three-step process. I wanna go through that with you all with a bunch of examples and a bunch of strategies so that you can leave this webinar with really concrete tools that you can use with your students. So let's first zoom in on acquire. And someone said something about, I see in the chat here, Ali, about trans, uh, ATL skills, approaches to learning. I would call a lot of those concepts as well. I would say that things we think of as sort of skills, such as investigating, such as questioning, asking questions, you can use that to follow in this model exactly. So research, uh, public speaking skills, if you can think of those also in this model. So I want to just like in this model that you are introducing, Judy, and maybe for the first time for many of our attendees, it's it's simple. Like those are three key words, and yeah. then the visuals aid a lot. And let's go now into the details and check what is each stage about. I'm so glad you said that because I highlighted the first letter of each word because how wonderful the acronym is ACT. Yeah. Because <laughs> we want students to act with informed action, not just 
in uninformed action. Um, and so we call it the ACT model. So first, acquire. Acquire understanding of individual concepts. So here's our four go-to strategies. The first one I shared with you already, four corners, where I give students four definitions. It doesn't have to be four, but we say four corners because we like students to physically walk around the classroom. It could be multiple choice, as I did with you all, A, B, C, D. But that's a quick way for students to make meaning of a concept that they're maybe heard before, but I want to sort of see what they think, like I did with you all with the word concept. The next one is concept attainment, which I also did with you with the three groups of words, group one, group two, group two, group three. You give students examples and sometimes you give non-examples and you have them compare. So that is another, that is my favorite strategy actually in teaching what is a concept. It's just a simple concept attainment. And then SEEI and the Freyer model, you guys may be familiar with both of those, they're in all my books, um, talk about students elaborating and consolidating on their understanding of individual individual concepts. So here's quick examples of each of those. Concept attainment. This is from a teacher who gave students a bunch of images and said, sort these into two piles. She gave them a speed limit sign. She gave them a protest sign. She gave them a jury. She gave them a for sale sign in front of a house. And students said, this group are things you're allowed to do. And this group is things you should do. So students are coming up with the critical attributes themselves for rights and responsibilities. So that's a quick example of a concept attainment. So many different ways you can do it, um, but what we're doing by giving students the examples to examine is having them look for the critical attributes. We're pointing their attention to the things that sort of make these examples similar so that they can go into their lives and into their world and start to see the world through these concepts. So the next step is to get your students to elaborate in some way. So I asked my little six-year-old, what is the solution? And my other son starts talking in the middle of it. So I typed it right here, but it's hysterical what he says. I just wanted to know, what is the solution? A, a solution means when you find a way to play with when you find a way to play without screaming, how funny is that? Uh, but he that he knows what a solution is. So really just asking your students to repeat back to me, what does this word mean? It makes them sort of elaborate on their understanding um, and really refine their understanding, consolidate their understanding. So often what students will do, especially young students, is give examples. When you say, what does this mean? They'll say, it means finding a way to play without screaming, finding a way to work together. I also love illustrations, non-linguistic representations of their learning. So here's an example of two characteristics of animals is that they can move on their own and use senses to interact with their environment. So the students use modeling clay or Play-Doh to sort of illustrate those things, move on their own and use senses to interact with their environment. It's a way to consolidate students' understanding. So both the Freyer model and SEEI have students illustrate. So does Marzano's, Robert Marzano's six-step vocabulary model is the sixth step or one of the six steps is illustrate, not non-linguistic representations, because the, the brain is thinking about the critical attributes um, of that particular situation. So once students have acquired, Ali, we're ready to go into connect. How do we help our students connect those concepts? That's the structure. That's the organized sets of ideas that those cognitive scientists were talking about. I love seeing this in chat. I have two of my, my co-authors are, are on, Ali. You probably are seeing that. I see Trevor Alio and Julia Briggs and also um, Kayla Duncan. They're, they're responding. Those are my co-authors. So. No, I see many of our, uh, my common friend as well, like putting uh, a lot of ideas. So uh, Sean is just commenting before we move to connect, elevating mm -hmm. skills to a conceptual level. Example, observation, prediction, interpretation is so powerful, but there is a real art to helping students understand what they are doing and why they are doing it. And I think this is really, we are missing this uh, in a very explicit way, telling them why we are doing those experiments or why we are doing those writings or why we are doing those grammar lessons. Otherwise, the answer will be the teacher told us to do it. Absolutely. Sean, you're so right. You're so right. And so this is one reason we created these visuals to go with it, the Acquire, Connect, Transfer 
because we share them with students. Uh, we share these visuals with students and have them talk about it. What's going on with these circles in Acquire? What's going on with these circles in Connect? Um, and so how do we promote that thinking? This is a visual of neurons firing. And I'm so glad you brought that up, Sean and, and, and Ali, what you said about being explicit with students, because what we're doing is I share with students why I'm so passionate about getting them to co connect concepts in relationship, because they're firing neurons in the brain they're getting those synapses talking to each other. Um, and that's what builds that organizational structure in the brain. And so here's our four sort of go-to strategies for that. Our most powerful one are our question stems, which again is on all of our books. Uh, the question stems plug those concepts right in and why they're so powerful is because they point students' attention to the way in which the world is organized. The next one that's in our upcoming book is called, the, these last three are in our upcoming book, but they're also on our website for free. So I'll make sure you guys can see that. Um, types of connections is a scaffolding. So I'll share that with you guys. So is click, it's simply a, a thinking tool to sort of have students monitor their thinking along the way. And Bolt is a digital version of a concept map. So I'll give you guys a few examples of all four of these strategies really quickly. Um, question Sims, what's the relationship or better one, what's the connection between this concept and this concept? That's the most vague and I like it the most because it doesn't tell students the answer. They have to come up with it. What's the connection between plants and animals? What's the connections between habitats and survival? You know, we can just throw them out there and the students have to come up with the answer. What's the role? What's the purpose? That last one really gets at that why you were speaking about earlier, Ali. Why do we care about these grammar exercises? What's the role or what's the purpose of this concept in this sort of larger picture? Here's types of connections. This is just a simple way to say to students, if you ask them like, you know, what's, what's the connection between uh, plants and animals? Or what's the role of questions in our investigations? How do they interact? Do they attract each other? Do they repel, repel each other? Do they strengthen each other? Do they block each other? And so my little son with that, with his baggie, this could be a scaffold. If I said, how does our investigation impact the materials? It's almost like giving him some, some choices to look at. Does our investigation attract the materials? Does it decrease the materials? What I'm looking for here is that it transforms the materials. Our investigation can transform materials. And so really a quick scaffold way is to sort of give students these, these types of connections as a way to help them to understand. And here's an example of a concept map. We love sticky notes. We are always using sticky notes. We put concepts on sticky notes. We have students put concepts on sticky notes and they sort them. And that builds that structure. This is what grade three students came up with. Grade three, what's the relationship between multiplication and division? So you can see the Twitter handle of my, my co-author here, Miss Kayla Duncan. Um, she's the one who, she's an instructional coach. She's the one who did this. And one thing she always likes to say when she's looking at this is you can see the eraser marks. If you look carefully, the students erased and rethought about, revisited their understanding. Um, and so it's so great to see the students sort of refine their thinking along the way. So that's just a quick quick mathematics example. And I typed up some of these here because I know you can't read what the students wrote. So I just typed up some of the things that they said. Incredible, the students are doing this without us telling it to them. So what you're doing right here by having a concept map is both deep learning and it's a formative assessment. Are they getting it? Are they seeing how all of these things are connected by asking them to do a concept map? Okay, so now we're ready for transfer. Take a look at that visual there. What's going on with this visual? So we've got the cycle arrows that sort of trying to represent transfer. We've got the connections and the other half is supposed to be a brain. I don't know, is that, is that obvious? <laughs> Ali saying that. So. <laughs> because we're trying to get at here is that those conceptual connections in the brain is what allows students to transfer their learning to new situations. So I wanna give you guys just a few quick examples for social studies, or you might call it humanities, social sciences. It's typically looking at other communities, other cultures, other co countries for history, other time periods. For mathematics, it could be other ways of depicting the concepts. For language arts, other texts, for science, 
other ecosystems. Um, but we say, look, or other investigations, as we did with my little son, we give them another situation and we say, how does your learning back in this thing we just did apply to this new situation? We have to do it intentionally and we have to build a culture of transfer. So here's what we call the learning transfer cycle. We ask that question, and then we take through students through a specific context. So I'll give you guys a couple of examples. And then we have over 200 examples of unit storyboards that I want to share with you guys towards the end. So here's one from my co-author, Natalie Lario, uh, that she did with her grade two students. What's the relationship between human beings, homes, and the natural environment? So first, they looked at the local environment. What's the relationship between human beings, homes, and the natural environment around their town? Then they looked at the national environment. She teaches in Canada, so it happened to be in looking at Canada. Then they transferred to the global environment. So this is the idea of having students really pay attention. Oh, Martin's saying she's here. Natalie's here. Natalie, my co in, in the in the call. Um, so having students transfer their learning to multiple situations. And so here is a picture from Natalie's classroom of one of her students. She gave them Jungle Island. So they, she teaches outside of Ontario. So there's nothing like this outside of Ontario. So totally new situation. And you can see the students sort of sketching out their ideas on paper before they went and built this little house, the jungle island. And what's really important is having students explain. Often that's the piece that really tells us their conceptual understanding. Why did you choose what you chose? And this student, Natalie, will say is that this student said, well, look, the tide comes in at night. So we had to build the house up high. And also there's scary jungle animals. And so they roll up that little ladder bridge at night so that the scary jungle animals can't come up there. But the student really explaining about how they use the natural environment to build the home and why they made the choices that they made to really show that they understand habitats, homes, built environment, natural environment, human beings, the relationship between all of those things. Okay, so here's some next day strategies that you guys can, you would not next day. Uh, so, <laughs> because if, if, unless you all teach on Sunday, um, some strategies you all could use Monday morning or the very next time you see your students. Expansive framing is a fancy way to really ask your students what, what concepts can you find in new situations or help them to see concepts in a variety of ways. So one is I'm social studies teacher. So if I'm teaching power, authority, conflict, I say, tell me the last time you had a conflict with a friend. And that's a way to sort of understand conflict before we talk about you know, war or something like that. But what's about a conflict with a friend? Um, so that's what expansive framing is. And then these conceptual questions, plug whatever it is you're teaching into these conceptual relationship questions and you will see the depth of understanding for students go way up. So here's what I wanna do for you all. I've been talking way too much. Here's your turn to put into chat. I love to use images. So this is from the cover of The Economist many, many, many years ago, but it's called the, they say the oiloholics. So I have some music. While the music is playing, could you put into chat, what concepts do you see in this image? Any concepts? What concepts do you see in this image? Go ahead and type into chat. I hope you don't want me to read them all, or shall I start reading? <laughs> no, just a few of them, a few of them. Okay, so exploration, resources, conflict, stereotypes, uh, connection, disagreement, uh, independence, government, uh, power again, power came so many times, uh, relationships and uh, conflicts again, dependency, connection, mm. Mm. Uh, form, access, anger, mm. globalization. Voila, these are some of the words uh, coming. I, I love as well the images. I love advertisement, Judy, because mm. advertisement also, it's a one minute, it's full of messages, it's very well designed, and again, related to life. So it brings a lot of meaning when we are using ad in the classroom to teach. Any absolutely, absolutely. 
And so we've been playing with this, uh, really just asking students, what concepts can you find here? Because what we're doing is we're training their brains to look at these scenarios. And I love what you guys are saying, because a lot of you are going to the content of this, such as power conflicts, uh, dependency. And some of you are looking at, at the sort of the message in the art, such as stereotypes um, and things like that. So really interesting to share these things because there's so rich environments out in the world. And that's what we're trying to do for our students is have them look at a situation and say, here's what I see. I see power. I see dependence. I see uh, conflict. I see stereotypes. Um, I see resources. I see relationship. All those things you are putting in there. That's what we want students to see. So I have a more uplifting one because that one was kind of depressing a, a little bit. So I always like to sort of balance it. This one's quite long um, for me. It's about a minute and a half, I think, or two minutes long, but you may have seen it before. I would love for you to watch this video and put as many concepts as you can find into chat. So here we go. What concepts can you find in this video? It's a little octopus. Concepts are everywhere now. Mm -hmm. I would add movement. and check the, the answers. So. <laughs> <laughs> endings. Yay. Yay for the little octopus. Responsibility. So many beautiful things you all said in chat. So thank you all so much for that. So here's what we have come up with um, that it's really powerful. So we took acquire, connect, transfer, but we made three different levels of transfer. So acquire understanding of individual concepts, connect them in relationship. And then, so I call them like, I always have my big mama question across the top. What is our relationship to plants and animals? And then I sometimes have some sub questions down below. How do plants and animals interact? Uh, how do humans interact with the earth's resources? 
And so we go from connect in a particular context to a similar transfer to have students really practice transferring to a very similar situation. And you can do that as many times as you want, but we also are looking at dissimilar transfer. So in this case, our relationship to plants and animals, I have students read the Lorax, which is a fiction book, um, but have students really look at the themes are very similar about humans and the earth. So it's a great way to bring in interdisciplinary work as well, especially with that dissimilar transfer. And then the final step that a lot of you said way back in the second slide, which is having students take action, having students use their learning to make the world a better place. And so all of these, we have over 200 of these organized by grade level and by subject area or discipline. Um, and so what they are is teachers from around the world have created these and they're all hyperlinked with so many different resources. So I wanted to share this kindergarten level example. Um, and there are some examples, Nelly just asked a question about mathematics. There are some examples about mathematics. And if you remember that one uh, visual that I shared, let me just jump back to it real quick for mathematics, um, where we're looking at how students are connecting concepts and relationships. So that's just the quick example of mathematics is a conceptual language. Um, and so really can, can be great for students to connect their understanding. And then here's one for secondary, because I know there's so many, uh, everybody wants to know well, how does this work for my particular subject? So I wanted to make sure I, see, I shared one with secondary so that you guys don't think this is an only an elementary approach. Um, but what's, this is my, our other teammate, Nichelle Pinckney, what's the relationship between institutions, equality, sustainability, and development. And so you can take students through this process even in that way. And so I just want to end sort of kind of coming back to the idea that we talked about way in the beginning of preparing our students for this changing world. The ACT model promotes agency and adaptability. We cannot predict what our students will face when they leave us. And so I want to just share with you all how we think a teaching students, um, as you said earlier, Ali, explicitly how to acquire, connect, and transfer their learning, building a culture of transfer will prepare them for anything, prepare them to face anything that they, they come across. So here's another visual from Thomas Friedman, who says basically, the, the rate of change among humans and technology is not kept even pace that technology has outpaced humans' ability to adapt. And right now we're in this space. Have you guys seen the, the uh, video of the robots dancing? Uh, it's, it's amazing. I'm sure you've seen it, but it is there. They have better rhythm than most humans. Um, and so it's just way, we're at a place where, where technology is outpacing humans' ability to adapt. And what is that doing? It's creating chaos in our world, really. Um, those of you who know what's happening in my beloved country right now is, is quite sad. We have uh, tanks in the street getting ready for um, the inauguration coming up next week. And so one of the things that we look to is media literacy. How does fake news spread? How does misinformation and disinformation spread? And a professor that we love is named Douglas Rushkoff. And he says, look, if my, I don't want to fix Twitter. I want to fix humans. So he says, I want my kid to be strong enough to not respond to a weaponized meme. And he says, what, the solution to disinformation and all this stuff is to maintain basic rapport with one another. And that once we start to experience the dignity in ourselves and in each other, then it becomes much harder to be controlled by anyone or anything. And I love that. We can do a better job coming together, talking, working out our differences, working out our disagreements, and we need to teach our young people how to do that. And so I want to offer just a big picture of where we're going with this, why we call our website Education to Save the World. So we think this is kind of the current path that we're on as a human species. The pace of change and the level of complexity leads us to have a difficulty with sense making. It's hard to make sense of the pandemic. How did this happen? What's going on? Why is my way of life so disrupted? And it leads to feelings of chaos, which then lead to addiction. How many of you gained, um, myself included, how many of you gained a little bit of weight since, since the coronavirus came, came around? We, we, you know, I was standing in my kitchen eating, ate an ice cream right out of the, the jug. Um, mental illness, conspiracy theories, and polarization. This is what we see all across the globe. And so what we're of proposing is an alternative path. If we can teach our young people how to make sense of the world through learning transfer and the ACT model, they can 
feel more sort of at ease. They can feel more agency and adaptability and control over their lives. And then only through calm and a sense of agency and a sense of control and a sense of adaptability can we solve the major challenges that are facing humankind right now, such as equity, sustainability, and well-being. So that's kind of our, our theory of change there I wanted to, to share with all of you. And lastly, I want to save a couple minutes for questions that you guys might have. I want to make sure you guys know where you can get all of this stuff. So if you go to edtosavetheworld.com, uh, and you, you hover over the resources tab, it will have a drop down menu. And then you can see there are two things I want to point your attention to. One is digital learning. So if you scroll down digital learning, you can see all those tools, four corners, the bolt map, the click model, all of those things um, are available for, for download. There are templates that you can check it out. And then the next one down below that is called unit storyboards, where you can see these things. I'm jumping back all the way over here. The over 200 of those things are what we call unit storyboards. So if you click on those, you can see them organized by grade band um, and also by discipline. So I just wanted to point your attention to those two things. Um, also, I know you're gonna, I know I go fast. I speak fast, especially for people who English is not your native language. Uh, Ali is going to record, is recording this and is going to put it on YouTube. So you guys can check it out. And then lastly, I would love to invite you all to join our Facebook group. So our Facebook group is called Learning That Transfers. I have a QR code here if you want to just scan it real quick with your phone. Um, you just ask us if you can join and we'll just say yes. And unless you do anything crazy, we'll keep you in. Um, but we'd love for you to join our Facebook group. And then we also have coming up, I mentioned a Future of Learning course, which is going to be launched on February 1st. So I hope you all keep in touch. And I just want to give Ali a few minutes for questions that people might have. I know my team has been answering answering the questions in chat a lot. <laughs> You're uh, doing great. So <laughs> I have a question. So, sure, but sure. I haven't read it, so it's here. But let me start with two comments and uh, I would like to hear your opinion or feedback. Uh, so someone was asking about concepts in early year and it's difficult. I would say that everything you do in early years is concepts, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, don't, don't uh, mm -hmm. overthink about it. What do you think, Julie? Yes, 100%. I would say when it comes to mathematics and, and reading um, and language learning, I would say make sure you go for understanding first and memorization second. And so I would say like when it comes to mathematics, we want students to understand what the heck two plus two means. So that's why we use manipulatives, which I'm sure you all are doing. You're taking two counting bears and two counting bears and the child can see that it makes four counting bears. And then you want them to practice their math facts. I want you guys to know that I am in favor of kids knowing their math facts with automaticity, with fluency. Um, I don't wanna start with that. I don't want kids to go two plus two is four and have no idea what that even means. Um, and so we often say for mathematics in particular, understanding first, memorization, second and really making sure the students understand why we're doing what we're doing okay so the second comment someone is asking about session in french so we're doing session in french so just check the youtube and then i'm not sure if julie has someone who's we a french do. speaker we and do. then he can join us as well and then we can have a session in french for all hours French speakers, they are fewer. So sometimes that's why we don't have a lot of French sessions, right. but we are doing them. I I, um, I have seen Marta asking how we can help teachers change their mindset from content teaching to conceptual understanding. And let me say, you can steal Julie idea. The three <laughs> slides of the beginning, uh, share these with the teachers and let mm -hmm. them think about the future and the changes of the future. And then hopefully they will come up with the idea that we need the change. Julie. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why we came up with this future of learning course. It's just 15 US dollars. So it's not, we're not even going to make money off of it but by the time we pay the, uh, the, the hosting site and everything. Um, but we, we, that's why we made it was because we felt that there are some teachers who really have to rethink their, their understanding of what it means to teach and learn in the 21st century. And so that's why it's called the future of learning course. It really helps with that. So the book that you are seeing now will appear very soon. It's it's not available yet, but the other books that we started the session with, yes, they are on Amazon. I have one of them here in my uh, professional development library. And I have a final question for Julie, it's mine. Action, uh, do you tell them, I want you to do this action or do you keep it implicit and then they come up with the action? Very good question. Most, most 
always, I, I want them to choose the action. Um, I leave it very open for the students to, and so that way you're not being sort of partisan, you're not telling them your political ideology, you're saying, hey, what do you guys think? What's a way that we can in, enhance this situation? What's a way that we can make the world a better place? And the students are coming up with it. And that's what's so great about concepts is because it doesn't matter how you sort of address uh, pollution or, or deforestation or something like that, because when you go through concepts, the students can choose. I want to. I want to work on a local river cleanup, or I want to do something that's all the way across the globe in another country. Okay, so let me finish with an announcement. If you have your calendar, put it on your calendar. 20 of February, another Saturday, where we are going to meet together under the big title. We are all special inclusion day and we will be talking in arabic in english about your student with difficulty and about your high achievers so i invite you all to join us i shared with you our website where you can find all our events you are now in our newsletter and then you have the youtube channel julie always great to meet you and to work yes. with you your passion your energy I was feeling it here in the room in Dubai, and uh, you can read all these. Thank you in the chat. Uh, seven hours online. I need now to go out and to practice. Exactly. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Take care I hope of your you well the day. For sure. Thank you, Ali. Thank you all to so much of you for joining. It was really great, um, and I hope you stay in touch. Alas.